Okay, let me start sharing my screen. Hello to everybody. We meet again today. And today I'm going to talk to you about another technique from unsupervised machine learning that it's also closely related with many, many physical problems. And it, the technique is clustering, mostly uh, make groups for natural groups. Uh, we can see some examples, for instance. Oops. Uh, the first question that one can make is what is a cluster? And a cluster, I think that all of you will agree with me that if I have this distribution of points in two dimensions, uh, for, for me, it's kind of clear that I have two clusters, right? Two groups of points. I think for everybody, it should be like that. But there are many, many clusters, possible clusters that we can imagine just in two dimensions. This one is strange, but it's anyway a, a group of three clusters. Uh, so the idea is that uh, what we are going to show you today and uh, to the next day, that it's Wednesday, I think, uh, it's just an overview of the techniques that we have for allowing our, our computers to do this in an automatic way, okay? Um, clustering, it has many, many utilities. I mean, it can be used, for instance, for decide a set of drugs from a library, or whenever you Google, uh, the algorithm performs a cluster for you before providing you the results. In image recognition, for instance, these are uh, images from a cancer. And when performing image recognition many times, a uh, preliminary step, you need to use a, a, cluster, a clustering algorithm. And everything that needs some kind of classification can be let's say, address with clustering techniques, okay? There are many types of clustering. I'm going to provide you some kind of classification in order to have in mind uh, the several types that we can have when we use a clustering algorithm. Um, imagine that you have something like that. If you have something like that, you can imagine that the most natural way of dividing these points is like that. But you can think also about something like that. Why not something like that? Or even something like that, or that. All these kind of clusters, I mean, all these clusters, partitions are equally valid. So uh, one thing is that the result of your clustering, it's going to depend on what you define that it's a cluster. <laughs> That's kind of a tautology, but it's always like that. There is not a mathematical definition of what it's a clustering. It's really problem dependent, okay? So each problem will have a different optimal clustering algorithm. And it also depends on how do you compare the points in that you want to cluster, that it's the metric. The metric that you use, for instance, for comparing two different configurations uh, will determine the results of your clustering. And also depends on the features that you have chosen. Imagine that you have, I don't know, a uh, 
simulation of a protein. Uh, you can try to cluster the, um, the configurations that you sample in your, in your simulation, depending on, let's say, the similarity to a given structure or also according with the, let's say, the angles explored during the simulation. I mean, the choice of these features, the choice of this metric, it's not trivial and it depends on the problem. Uh, in some cases, it's kind of trivial, but in many cases, it's not so trivial. So it's something that one, that one must have in mind when applying cluster algorithms. It's not that you can use a black box method for clustering. You have to take all these variables into account. I'm going to provide you, as I told you, a classification of the different clustering algorithms. And I would provide a classification according to the output of the cluster. Uh, the first, the, let's say the easier clustering, it's the flat clustering. In flat clustering, you perform just a hard partition of your data in groups, into groups, okay? Then in fancy clustering, you um, perform also a partition of your data into groups, but instead of assigning each point to a cluster, you assign a degree of membership. I will show you later what's uh, that precisely. Finally, on hierarchical clustering, instead of having a single partition, you generate a tree. And this tree of partitions allows you to see many, many, many partitions. It's a kind of dendrogram. It's a kind of classification uh, tree. I don't know if you think about, for instance, when you were in the school and you were studying species of animals, there was the vertebrates, the, inside the vertebrates there were the mammals, the reptiles, so on so far, okay? Till you arrive to species and individuals. Uh, here we do something similar. Let's see later what's going on. I, I will go into the, in detail for each of these points. Uh, in flat clustering, as I told you, each element is assigned to a single cluster. I, assigned to point one belongs to cluster two, point two to cluster two also, point three to cluster one, let's say, so on so far. Um, and in traditional methods, what you have is that you need to define the number of clusters that you, you have, and it's provided as an external parameter to the algorithm. Um, they, the question is that usually when one performs clustering, one looks for a hard partition. One wants to say that the uh, elements belongs to a given group, okay? Each element belongs to a group. That's what's flat, flat clustering. But by definition, for instance, if your structure, if your data structure is multi-level, uh, you cannot deal with that. This is a case of flat clustering in which I divide my points in five groups. Each set of points colored with the same color uh, belongs to the same group, okay? Fancy clustering is a bit more sophisticated. As I told you, you give a degree of membership to each cluster, to each point in the, to each cluster. Uh, of course, since a point cannot be, cannot count more than one point, this membership vector is normalized. It, it belongs to, in this way, okay? And again, the number of clusters should be provided usually. And it's not always easy to transform a, uh, fancy clustering into a hard partition. 
In this case, for instance, if I perform a FATSI clustering on this set of points, I will obtain something like that. For this point, I would say that the 90% it's assigned to cluster one, and 9% it's assigned to cluster two, and marginally it's assigned to cluster five. This other point that it's in the middle between cluster one and two belongs 45% to cluster one, 50% to cluster two, and a bit to cluster three. This point do not belong any to cluster one, nor to cl a bit to cluster one, nothing to cluster two, kind of a lot to cluster three, more to cluster four, and a bit to cluster five, and so on so far. Okay. Uh, please, if you have questions, interrupt me. Because um, I don't, I cannot see the chat. So, uh, excuse me. Yes. Uh, in the flat clustering, uh, uh, the number of clusters was uh, arbitrary, arbitrary, or um, how how you um, choose five clusters in the previous okay. classes? In the, let's say in this case. I chosen because I, I have seen the points mostly and I decide. But in general, we will see the, the techniques for choosing the number of clusters. It's not trivial, but it, it, I, now it's just a kind of introduction to the me different methods. When I explain the methods in detail, we will, we will go to that point into, uh, with a bit more detail. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Finally, hierarchical clustering. Uh, sorry. In, as I told you, it produced a set of nested clusters. It's kind of hierarchical tree. Okay. It's it's the output is visualized as a tree. It's just, I, I, we will see that later. But by doing like as a tree, you don't need any assumption about the number of clusters. Okay. Uh, if you are lucky, a uh, hierarchical clustering can may correspond to a meaningful taxonomy. It means that if there is a multi level structure in your data, uh, what you want. It's that your hierarchical clustering reproduce this multi-level structure. And just by cutting the tree, it can be transformed in many hard partitions. For instance, what I would obtain if I have something like that, it's this partition where you see that all the points are kind of in the tree until I, I'm kind of merging trees until I have the structure. This is a good multi-level structure in the sense that it's, I see that cluster red and yellow are more connected, let's see, let's say that green, blue, and purple, right? And also I can see that green and blue are more connected and then to the th third one and so on, okay? This is what a hierarchical clustering provides you, some kind, a part of some kind of partition, it also provides you some kind of view of the structure of your data, okay? However, it's not easy to flat. For instance, in this case, I'm, I obtain the two cluster partition easily by dividing with a straight line. But it's in this case, for obtaining the five cluster partition, I have to do something like, it, like that. It's kind of ad hoc. So it's not so easy to do it in real world applications, okay? I did it here just as example, but I would not know how to do it if I cannot see the data, okay? So, okay, uh, let me check if there are questions in the chat and 
before going ahead. Okay. There are many questions. Let me start replaying them. Uh, what are the mathematical differences between these methods? Okay, the question is that uh, what I'm not uh, talking is about actual methods. I'm talking about general classes of methods, uh, flat, um, FATSI and hierarchical clustering are classes of methods. Each of them contain many different kinds of methods. So uh, for replaying that, you should see each of the different methods. In general, in the, let's say, generally speaking, the differences between these three classes is the output. In one case, you have a, a hard partition. It, it means a single assignation that corresponds one to from each element to a given cluster. In the FATSI one, you have a degree of membership. And in this case, you don't have a single partition, but you have a tree of partitions. Um, can we use the number of components from PCA as guide for the number of clusters? Uh, not exactly, because uh, it's different. Let's say the dimension of in which your da data lives, it's not necessarily the number of groups that you have. I mean, for instance, uh, the, the number of components of PCA in this case would be two but the number of clusters would be five, right? Um, regarding the hierarchical clustering, do you have any references on this non straight cut of the dendrograms? Let's see, uh, there are, uh, I should look for that. It's long since I'm not looking for non straight cut. There are many methods trying to optimally divide a uh, cluster, a uh, uh, tree. Mm, as far as I know, none of, none of them is generally applicable. So I decided not to explain them, but we can, I can check. I mean, it's something that it's still a work in progress for the community, community trying to decide a general method for non straight cut of the dendrograms. Another question. It's uh, what about the position of the dots? On what basis are they placed? Okay, I these are examples. I put them by hand, <laughs> but in general, generally speaking, what they represent is the um, the position of your data. Uh, in the case of physical many body systems, that the ones that we are interested. They are usually all the coordinates of your space. Uh, if you are talking about, let's say, the XY model of the or the 2D icing, the positions of each configuration would be all the spins, the all the all the coordinates of each of the spins uh, in your uh, in your system. Okay. What is the point in using clustering techniques if the result depends on the technical number of clusters, etc.? Well, uh, the point is that you need it. Uh, so usually what happens is that you need to perform some kind of division of your data. And the idea is that, of course, uh, since you need it, you, you need to know all the clustering techniques. So let's say the best you know the clustering te techniques, the better uh, you can decide the technique to apply to your data. So the point is that it's mostly a matter of needing. Uh, I, in many cases, you need to blindly 
because it's not said that you need you can seed your data uh, divide your your data in groups it's useful for many many things and since it's useful and you need it uh, you need to apply these techniques it's nothing to okay uh, there is a, another question uh, of richmond this is a kind of uh, technical question about the silhouette score in assessing clustering techniques depending on data context how reliable is the silhouette score coefficient uh, i would tell you that it's a coefficient that i don't like especially because it's it has the problem that it uh, tends to uh, over score let's say spherical clusters spherical like clusters it's a coefficient that of course uh, if the uh, let's let me show you i sorry for the other people but in i think it deserves a replay if you have something let me go back like that uh, the score coefficient of this partition will would be really really low because uh, the silhouette coefficient somehow relies in the fact that your data is more or less um, compressed it's more or less spherical but if your data it has a weird way of being clustered it's not going to uh, give, give you the, the correct answer. In many cases, however, it's a good option. In cases when you have uh, some <coughs> hints about the way your clusters are in, and you think that are something like this, in these cases, the silhouette coefficient will work perfectly. I don't know if I replay your your answer. Okay, how can we say that uh, a clustering which is applied to data is reliable or not? Uh, mostly what you do is to rely in the, in the experience, in the sense that you have uh, cases in which uh, you test your methods, and if your method works in really similar cases to the one that it's under study, you somehow trust. The other method is just to try to apply external coefficients like the one mentioned by your colleague, the silhouette coefficient, that try to measure, give you some kind of measure of how good how compact for instance are your clusters but this is kind of um, really dependent on the actual shape of your cluster so it's not so i personally speaking i don't like it so much according to me the best way is to perform an external validation in some data set that in which you know the groups and try to see that if you, this data set is really sim, it's similar to the ones in which you are applying the method, then you can rely on the method. Okay, let me go to the first method that I want to explain to you. And the first method that I want to explain to you is the k-means clustering. Uh, this one it's um it's the let's say the father of all the clustering algorithms and it's still widely used i put here a, a reference but there are several references that can that are used as the reference for k means and they still have thousands of citations by year i mean it's something that it's increasing and increasing and increasing 
uh, it's still really, really useful, okay? So what is K-means? Uh, K-means, what does? It's, it attempts to minimize the intra-cluster distance while it means the distance between points belonging to the same cluster, while maximizing the intercluster distance. It's the distance between clusters. It's based on the concept of cluster centroid. A cluster centroid is the average position of the cluster elements. As I told you, it's still widely used. And it can be easily parallelized and almost linearized. It means that it's really, really fast. But as I told you, the user must provide K, the number of clusters. So what one measures is this objective function or loss function. And the method tries to minimize that. Uh, theta is the array of the that reflects the class designation in clusters, okay? And CL is the vector of the coordinates of the cluster centroid, okay? So for your loss function, it's the sum for all the clusters of this quantity, where this delta theta i, it's all um, the difference, it's zero if i is assigned to a cluster that it's not L. And it's one if i is assigned to the cluster L. Okay. Uh, so what you compute here, it's just the average of the of the coordinates, and here you compute the sum of the square of the distances from uh, each element assigned to the cluster to the center of the cluster. This is what we try to minimize, and the way of, for minimizing that it's just with a really easy algorithm. The first thing that we do is to initialize uh, the cluster centroids. And the cluster centroids are points randomly chosen from the data, okay? Then we enter in a loop in which we first decide the membership of all the data points by assigning them to the nearest centroid, okay? And then we recompute the centroids by using this formula. This way of, of minimizing allows you to, in this step, minimize the intra-distance, intra-cluster distance. It, because you are just saying, okay, I'm assigning all the points, all my data points to the center that it's near, the nearest center, okay? And then when you update your centroid, what you do is to maximize the interdistance because you are saying, okay, if my two centers are nearby, I can recompute um, the centers, I will recompute the centers just as the average of the, these, of the positions of my data in the clusters. Uh, Lucio ask a question, I will replay it later, okay? It's in the lecture, it's in the program of the lecture. So, for instance, imagine that you have your data, this data. What the first thing that you do it's to randomly pick K centers. I, in this case, I pick 15 centers. Then I assign 
I, the computer assigns each point to its nearest center. Now you can see that they are of the same color. And then I recompute the centers, okay? And it means that I move the centers towards the center of my cluster. And then I, I continue iterating, okay? This procedure is known to converge, it must converge, and it converges when there is no change in the assignation of points. So you have a center and the assignation of points, but it's not said that you must arrive to the global minima. So what happens is that when you do this iteration, sorry, when you perform these iterations, you arrive to a minimum, but it's not necessarily the, mi the global minimum of the loss, okay? And you can see that, for instance, in this case, in which I know the solution is 15 clusters, I assign K to 15, but due to the minimization procedure, I have, for instance, these two clusters divided by two, or these two clusters merge, okay? This is a problem due to the fact that my, my initialization, it's random, okay? So I, I arrive to a given minimum in the, of the loss function, but not necessarily to the global one. So, K means that it's the father of all the methods, but it's a really pretty old, has some weakness. And I'm, we are going to comment them. Um, the first one is the one that I already commend you. It's sensitive to initialization. Uh, yes, to share. They are totally random. Let me finish this point, because now we are going to see that. I mean, if we pick this, I will have one solution. If I pick another sentence, I will have another solution that in this case is optimal, but I can have other solutions that are far from optimal. So each different initialization will give me a different result. What, uh, people suggest to do it to perform a better initialization that it's not totally random, but still random. One would be, uh, and this better initialization, the most used method is K means plus plus, in which you, the first center, you choose it at random. Then you compute the distance from all the data points to the center and take them to the already assigned centers and take the minimum, okay? And then you choose a new cluster with a probability that it's proportional to the square of this quantity. That the idea, the only idea, I'm, we are not going to into the details because we don't have lot of time, but the idea is, okay, if I pick one center in one place, the next center that I pick, it's better if it's far away from the one that I choose, okay? So that's the final idea. You are choosing centers with more probability when they are far away from the existing centers. Okay. And then you, perform k-means with these centers. So imagine that you have this case and I pick, choose k equal to three. Two. Uh, th the first step, I will pick randomly with a uniform probability, one point. Let's say I pick the six. Now I compute the distances from all the points to this center. I pick the minimum, 
that in this case it's the by itself the, the distance to the center. And then I pick the next center with a probability that it's proportional to this minimum distance to a given center square. So what will happen is the probabilities of these points that are far away from center six would be bigger than these probabilities, right? So I would pick, for instance, center one. So if I pick this point and this point, what happened is that now I have to repeat, compute the distances from, um, sorry, from a center and the minimum. These minimums would be for the nine this, for the eight this one, for the two would be this one, for three would be this one, four, five, seven, okay? So now what would happen in the last, I would pick a new center with a probability that it's proportional to the square of this minimum. So the probabilities of points eight and nine would be much higher than four, five, seven, two, three, okay? Therefore, I would probably pick one of them, sorry. For instance, the nine, and that's all. Now I have these three points, three centers that are not anymore uh, randomly picked, but picked in a wise way. And in this way, I will probably obtain the global uh, minimum for this loss function in which I have three clusters here. Okay. So this is one of the weakness and it has been addressed in this way. Um, the other, another weakness that you all asked me for, it's which K employing, which number of clusters. Um, in K means it's usually, this problem is addressed by what it's called the screw test. And this test, what happens is that what I plot, I compute my k means for k equal to one, k equal to two, k equal to three, k equal to four, five, six, seven, so on so far. I do the k means with all these different number of k's and I plot my loss function. I can call it the similarity objective function, whatever. It's the loss function, the sum of the distances from all the data points to the centers of the clusters. If I plot that, I obtain what it's called the street test. And I look at this plot for an elbow. If I have an elbow, I can say kind of confident that the correct number of K is three in this case. This quantity should be, if we arrive to the optimal, the similarity is the, um, sorry, Alejandro, uh, it's the loss function, it's exactly, sorry, let me go back, that. Okay, uh, this is, it's a different way of calling this objective function or loss function, the similarity, but whatever, it's that, okay? So, you plot the values of the loss, the loss function for each different partitions, and you look for an elbow. Of course, science, uh, you, your k-means algorithm, it's sensitive to initialization. What usually it's done is to take, let's say, 10 runs for each number of clusters and take the minimum value. Okay. 
Then it's sensitive to outliers. Why it's sensitive to outliers? Imagine that you have something like that. You would agree with me that the optimal partition would be here, right? But now I adding a point, okay, and these are the cluster centers. Now I'm adding a point that is this one. That is far away. It's what it's an, called an outlier. What I would like is to have the same partition. Because this point is far away, it's just one point. Why should it modify my partition? However, what happens? is that it moves a lot my center because it's really far away. So if you remember the formula for centers, it has a lot of weight in my centers. So it moves my centers. And by moving my centers, what may happen is that my partition, it's not anymore the optimal one. Okay, That's the reason why it's really sensitive to outliers. Uh, so people provide uh, try an, an option, a different way of doing k-means. It's what it's called k-methoids. And k-methoids, it's the k-means method, mostly the k-means method, but instead of working with centroids, you work what it's called methoids. And by methoids, that it's, let's say, it should remember median instead of mean. Uh, the methods are an element of the data that it's the most central element of the cluster. So you are optimizing, let's say, your centers, but restricting yourself to have centers belonging to the data set. You can see that this will somehow uh, mitigate the effect of outliers, right? Because if you have something like that, your center will never be here. It would be here, okay? Because you, you are not allowed to move your center far from the data. And having the center here, you will recover the correct uh, the correct partition. Uh, Lucio Garcia asked me if it's like selecting the most center point in the simplex of the data. Uh, it's the most center point in the cluster, not in the simplex. So it's a bit different, but the idea is the same. I mean, you choose the most center point by just the one that minimizes the sum of the distances from all the rest of data belonging to the cluster. Okay. So this k methods has an additional advantage. And the additional advantage is that it can be used with whatever distance that you have within your points. Okay. Because while in the case of k means you are using the properties of uh, Euclidean distances for computing the, uh, the, the centroids. In k methods you just need distances between all your data points. So you don't need to these distances to be the Euclidean distances between data points. It can be whatever kind of distance that you want to employ. And finally, yes, I want to uh, say the last problem for spherical clusters. And the last problem is that it is only allows you to find what it's called spherical clusters. It's not that they are spherical, but let me explain it to you a bit better with one example. Imagine that you have something like that. Uh, if you have something like that and you apply k-means, k-methoids, whatever, you are going to have, in the best case, with k equal to two, something like that. With k equal three, something like that. 
with k equal four, something like that. You are not going to be able never to reproduce these two clusters with k mains, no k medoids. And that came for, but because the way that you define the centers do not allow you, I mean, to perform, to obtain something like that. Because a point that it's near to this, uh, in the center of this cluster would be assigned by distance to the center, okay? In this, this, in this sense, you can talk about spherical clusters because the points are assigned to the nearest center, okay? Um, so this problem it's uh, addressed with by other methods, like k means, like uh, how, how kernel k means. But uh, today I don't. I'm not going to arrive to them to these methods. Uh, I think for today we can leave it here. Okay, not for today, but. I want to replay your questions before continuing. So I was, there is one that it, is it possible that there be more than one minimum elbow in the cost function? The, the answer is yes. Yes, mostly imagine that you have a multi-level structure. In this case, you would probably obtain more than one elbow. Uh, more questions? If there are no more questions, I can go to the uh, next point that it's the fat CC means. Um, this is a method that is quite old, uh, newer than K means, it's something like 10 years newer. And old, of course, because it's from 84, and it's still also uh, widely used. As I told you, it's a version, it can be considered as a version of k-means where the assignation is fatty, in the sense that you have a degree of membership to from each point to each cluster. And once you consider that, you just adapt your loss function uh, and the optimization algorithm to this, to fulfill this, okay? The idea is that your new loss function, it came from this formula, where you, it's the assignation that now it's a matrix, right? Because you have a, degree of member for each element, you have a vector of assignation. So the total assignation of your cluster, it's a matrix. And what you compute is the distances from all the points, the square distances from all the points to the centers, in which you consider the uh, weight of the uh, membership, okay? This M, it's a parameter of the method. You can say that by in general, M is equal to two. It's what it's widely used. And now the center, it's also compute as the average, but the average weighted by the memberships of each element. Once you have this loss function and this way to compute the centers, what you do is, in this case, the algorithm is a bit different. Instead of picking centers, you random initialize your uh, memberships and then compute the centers. And from the centers, you update the memberships. Uh, this formula for updating the memberships, it's not important, but it's exactly that. And it's just a way that saying that uh, the 
membership of a data point to a cluster would be bigger if the center is near. Okay, that's kind of logical. And it's normalized by using this formula, you have normalized uh, memberships. And since now the memberships are not integral numbers, but real numbers, uh, you have to put a threshold in the exchange of uh, the membership metrics in order to finish the iterative, the iterative procedure. Okay. It has uh, the same problems like k means. I mean, you it's sensitive to initialization. The number of clusters uh, you have to decide it. And you can decide it also with the script plot. It's also sensitive to outliers. And now there is not a k Medoich way of, uh, of solving that. And it generates clusters that are near the center. However, this is somehow mitigated by the fact that you have a fancy assignation. Okay. Questions? Maybe I was too fast on that, but now we have time for questions. So, if there are no questions, I think we are going to finish here. So, oh. okay, there are no questions. Uh, let me stop the, the sharing and nothing. Uh, I would share my the slides on not he, not now. I would share the slides with the notes or also in the in the matrix. Okay. Um, that's all. Mateo, I think we can stop the, the recording.